Good morning to all of you. My name is Jessica Holmes, and I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. So today is day two of our uh, Green Mountain Care Board hospital budget hearing process. Just as a reminder, um, I said this on Monday, but I'll say it again today. I'll say it at the start of every uh, hearing day that we have to conduct our analysis and ultimately make a decision for each hospital. We have to look to our statute and our hospital budget rule for guiding principles. Our review requires us to balance several often competing factors. For example, the need to slow the growth in healthcare expenditures while also ensuring that our hospitals have the resources they need to recruit and retain healthcare workers and provide the high quality care we expect in our communities. As we're looking to balance you know, these competing factors of cost containment, access, quality, and health system sustainability, we have to be mindful of this year's unique circumstances uh, and the significant headwinds that we're facing. We have historically high inflation rates, workforce shortages, and the continuing impacts of COVID-19. So both nationally and in Vermont, we're seeing hospitals facing unprecedented financial challenges as our businesses, families, and individuals. So. What lies before us is not easy. I think we all know that. Our short-term task is to set fiscal year 23 hospital budgets for the 14 community hospitals, and we have to do this by September 25th, I mean, September 15th, sorry. Uh, with that said, I wanna remind everybody that the board is working closely with the Agency of Human Services to begin the work that outlined in Act 167 which aims to move us closer to a sustainable hospital system that's going to ensure better ensure that Vermonters have access to high quality, affordable care. That longer term work is going to involve extensive data analysis and community and hospital engagement to identify options for a more sustainable path forward. So as we return to the task at hand, I want to extend a thank you to each of the hospitals presenting today for the time and effort taken to submit the documents for our review. There's a few housekeeping no notes for today. Um, the presentation is a public meeting. It's being recorded and transcribed. So there will be a publicly available record. If any hospital's leadership believes that there's confidential information that the Green Mountain Care Board should consider, either as part of the hospital's presentation or in response to board or staff questions, please alert us before responding. If needed, the Green Mountain Care Board has the ability to go into executive session to review confidential information from hospitals. I just want to note, though, that executive se sessions are limited in scope as provided by the open meeting law, and they're limited to information such as contracts and information that would be considered confidential under the Public Records Act. So if an issue of possible confidentiality arises, I'll call on the board's legal counsel to determine the scope of what could be discussed in executive session, and if deemed appropriate and at the appropriate time, I'll ask the board member for a motion uh, for us to go into that executive session. So knowing we have a really tight schedule today, we have three hospitals um, that we wanna hear from. Uh, I'm gonna hold all board and staff questions until the end of each hospital's presentation. Northwestern, is your entire team here? Everybody? Yes, we are. Great, okay, well, welcome. Hospital number three for the day. Uh, I appreciate you coming and all the work you've done in advance to prepare for this presentation and submit all the materials. I know what a lot of work that is. Um, so it's very much appreciated from all of us. And Jonathan, from one interim to another interim, I appreciate what you've taken on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and likewise. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so knowing we have a, a tight schedule here, I'm going to hold all the board and staff questions until the end of your presentation. Um, and the, the hope is that we will be able to wrap up your presentation by four. That's the schedule that we have. So, and then we will have some questions after that. Um, Russ McCracken, our wonderful legal counsel, can you please swear in all the witnesses that will be presenting today from Northwestern? Great, yeah, happy to. This is Russ, uh, staff attorney with the board. Um, for the Northwestern team, can I ask who uh, is going to be speaking this afternoon? Yeah. So for us, that will be myself, Jonathan Billings, uh, Jake Holscheider, our board president, um, Pam Parsons, community partner from Notch, uh, Stephanie Bro, chief financial officer, uh, Dr. John Minadeo, our chief quality, and medical officer and 
potentially answering questions uh, as we go. Devin Batchelder, our uh, director of budget and um, decision making. All right, terrific. Well, let's swear everybody in. We can do it uh, all together if you'd raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Great, thanks so much. And um, the first time you speak, if you could identify yourself by name, that would help a lot with the um, transcription in the court reporter. And so with that, I will turn it back uh, to you, Chair Holmes. Great, and I will pass the baton on to you all at Northwestern. I can see your slides, so that's a good start. Excellent, good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate this time to uh, present to you today. Um, I'm Jonathan Billings. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Northwestern Medical Center and currently serving as the Interim Chief Executive Officer for the hospital. Uh, pleased to be with you today. Pleased to be joined um, by four colleagues who will be sharing in the presentation, two from the hospital senior leadership team and two from our community. And so I would invite those folks to um, introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with Stephanie. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Bro, and I am the CFO at Northwestern. And Dr. Minadeo. You appear to be on mute. Okay, not a good start. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, John Minadeo, I'm an emergency medicine doc here for um, most of my career and for the past three years, the chief medical and quality officer. And Jake. Uh, hi, my name is Jake Holscheider. I'm the NMC board president. Thank you. And Pam. Hi, Pam Parsons, Executive Director of Notch Northern Tier Center for Health, FQHC in Franklin and North, Northern Grand Isle. And Devin. Hi, Devin Batchelder, uh, Decision Support and Budget Manager here at Northwestern Medical Center. Thank you. And I would like to give Devin and his uh, team in fiscal uh, great credit for the budget package that you have before you today. That team does tremendous work in this and we deeply appreciate it. I would also thank the Green Mountain Care Board members and the Green Mountain Care Board staff for the effort that all of you put into this process. Um, we appreciate your work as well. And with that, I'll invite Jake, our board chair, to open our presentation with brief remarks. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, as I indicated, my name is uh, Jake Holscheider and I am the current NMC board chair. Um, just to kind of reiterate just a little bit about what chair Holmes was started with i just want to recognize that we, we have a we have a really strong leadership team at the hospital and we're fortunate to have jonathan and the rest of the team um, to help and to uh, to lead our team confidently without missing any beats as we look for a new ceo so we, we feel very fortunate to have such a strong team um, and to be able to have an interim uh, within the organization um, to step up for us during during this time. So I'd like to start with that. Um, and then as the board chair, I'd just like to summarize uh, three areas before we get going. Uh, one is, obviously, we, we ask that you approve our budget as submitted. The, the budget we feel complies with the Green Mountain Care Board's guidance and the budget results in a modest 1% operating budget. Two, we're excited to share with you our high reliability journey, what it means for our community hospital, and ultimately becoming a CMS five-star rated facility. And then three, we believe that we have a strong future at NMC, and the pandemic and continual demand proves the need for a strong community hospital in the St. Albans and Franklin County area. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and Jonathan, I'll hand it back over to you uh, and the team for the meat and potatoes of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Um, 
we'd like to to move forward with providing um, some of the crucial pieces of context that shape our budget request this year. Um, the first of these is the trended history of NMC's operating margins. Um, our projections for fiscal year 22 put NMC's net operating margin as negative for the fifth time in the past six years. That is not a sustainable pattern. Um, for 22, our expenses are essentially on track except for our investment in travelers. Our revenues are essentially on track. And so we are. you will hear throughout the presentation of our focus on restoring our workforce and returning travelers to being an emergent stopgap as opposed to a reliant way to provide health care. Um, our 2023 budget, um, as you've seen, as Jake mentioned, um, puts our target for this graph at a positive 1% margin. And I'll tell you that that feels ever so slim given all of the volatility um, that we face. Long term, a not-for-profit community hospital should have an operating margin mm -hmm. around 3% to be sustainable. And it is our goal to get there. However, this year, as we looked at all of the factors involved, um, including affordability, access, et cetera, uh, we felt 1% was the margin that was um, proper to bring forth. Um, the next piece of critical context that I wanna talk to you about is hospital capacity. Um, 30 out of 30 days in June, NMC boarded patients in the emergency department either awaiting um, inpatient admission to our uh, progressive care unit that would have been full at 34 patients at that time, or boarded patients awaiting mental health placement um, elsewhere in the community in the state. Um, and so that's very challenging for our emergency department. We've seen a significant increase in subacute patient days given challenges with finding proper placement for patients. We've gone so far as to have to cancel elective surgeries um, in October and then um, in June due to a lack of available inpatient beds. That's not staffed beds, that's available mattresses. Um, our inpatient units have been consistently full. Um, and we have had as many as 11 patients boarding, awaiting placement or admission in an emergency department that has 14 formal rooms. And we've had as many as 12 patients on our 34 bed inpatient unit awaiting acceptance at a local nursing home. And so the challenges are real and we live them every day. And I'm gonna pause for a moment and talk to you about my weekend. Um, I was administrator on call this Sunday. We had 43 patients for a 34 bed unit. Um, only one of those was COVID positive. Our day was complicated because we had staff out on COVID, but only one of our medical inpatients was COVID positive. Four were in the ICU, four were step down level, 14 were med surge, 12 were subacute waiting placement, seven others were boarding in the emergency department, one of whom was intensive care unit level that we could not move to our inpatient unit and two were med surge level that were housed upstairs in our family birth center. We had to call in extra staff paying double incentive. We had staff who were on stay late. We had a family birth center nurse float to the emergency department to care for three of the medical inpatients. Our charge nurse took a full assignment. We increased our ratios. Both our PCU director and our chief nursing officer took charge nurse duties that day, and I helped with trash and linen to help housekeeping keep up. It's not an unusual day for us. It's not every day, but it is not an unusual day for us. Our local nursing homes struggle and cannot take patients on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, and this drive, drives up length of stay for patients. Um, because essentially, if you have not been transferred to a nursing home Thursday afternoon, you're not going till Monday afternoon. And those are just extra days in the hospital. 
Other Vermont hospitals, including our tertiary care center, have experienced similar capacity issues, and so transferring patients has been um, a significant challenge. We recently transferred um, a very concerning critical infant to Manchester, New Hampshire, because all of the closer NICUs were full. And so we literally sent an ambulance to, to Manchester. Um, our subacute patients with complicating factors can be housed with us for months. We have one individual um, who is awaiting subacute placement who has now lived with us for 237 days without a facility being willing to accept that person. Our mental health um, placements uh, for inpatients continue to take days or weeks, depending on the situation elsewhere in Vermont. And I will go out and opine that um, what I have just described to you and what our staff is living every day completely defies the consultant report that you have heard previously that placed NMC as a 70-bed licensed hospital rather than a 34-bed inpatient hospital and considered that we had too many beds. And that report was referenced once again on statewide radio in a recent NPR um, story, and it gives our community a completely unrealistic picture of what capacity is when we stand here at overcapacity. And Steph, if you'll jump to our, the feeding right into this is unprecedented workforce challenges. And on the screen, you'll see a number of strategies that we're using um, to try and meet our workforce needs to keep up with uh, patient care. And there are strategies that every hospital in Vermont and every hospital in the country are also using at the same time. Uh, you'll see that our traveler projection for 2022 was 10.2 million at the time we made this budget. Um, it has since grown that projection to 11.2 million. Uh, it is the single most threatening thing for NMC um, in the short term. Um, but we rely on those travelers at this point as we work to uh, restabilize the, work, the nursing workforce in Vermont and at NMC. Um, we have hired a new chief human resources officer and he is here to lead us in the reimagination of our retention and our recruitment efforts. Um, we have a tremendous partnership with CCV and Vermont Tech that is growing nicely and is full this year in both of their classes for nurses. So we are working hard to grow our own. And a point I wanna make is that the issue goes well beyond nursing. Um, we need lab techs, we need ultrasound techs, we need other diagnostic imaging professionals. We need housekeepers. We need folks to work in our food services department. Um, this morning I had another conversation with an EVS worker who envisions a program with the state that connects us with higher ability and maybe CCV and with state programs to help with childcare and transportation because he feels there are people out there that would like to work but who have barriers in their lives. And if we could help them pass the barriers, that they would love to work full-time at NMC. And so uh, Luke Werner speaks passionately about it and he's meeting with myself and Ryan Hamill, our new chief uh, human resources officer next week to dig deeper into this. Um, but workforce challenges are something that impact capacity and access every day for us. And our folks are tired. Um, and then there's NMC strategic plan as um, the final kind of shaping piece that I'll share with you. Um, NMC strategic plan is pretty straightforward. Um, it's three areas of focus. Um, this was developed by the NMC board of directors in collaboration with community partners, with community input through our community health needs assessment, um, and with our medical staff. And it's three areas of focus quality and safety. We need to achieve zero preventable harm and sustain uh, zero preventable harm. Jake talked about becoming a five-star CMS uh, facility. Our community deserves that level of quality. We will get there. Financial sustainability. Our strategic plan is to keep care local by enhancing core services, 
achieving operational effectiveness, and supporting effective community partnerships. Tremendous amount of focus in that area as we go forward. And then a hospital is truly about people. And so our third area of strategic focus is engagement. It's fostering a culture which inspires and engages our people and our community. And that's our plan. That's our path forward. Um, it is my charge from our board to maintain progress in these three areas. And we're intentionally recruiting a new CEO who will lead us forth in this direction that shares this vision of an exceptional community hospital that can earn a leapfrog A and that can earn CMS five star. So that's where we're headed. And to expound a little bit on our work around quality and high reliability, um, I'd like to turn it to Dr. John Minadeo, our Chief Medical Quality Officer. Thank you, Jonathan. In 1977, the Tenerife Airport in the Canary Islands was the site of the deadliest commercial airline disaster in history. And that turned out to be a tipping point. Um, it was, not only was a tragedy on that day, but it was an existential threat to the industry because if people didn't feel safe getting on an airline, um, there wouldn't be business. Um, so they recognized they needed to change their processes and they needed to change their culture. So they embarked on that and they embarked on that with what we now look back on as the principles of high reliability. How do you do something in a complex organization with um, where small errors can result in catastrophic uh, outcomes reliably over and over and over again in a safe manner? And so what they found is they flattening the hierarchy uh, of, of communication, promoting safety, empowering staff to raise concerns, empowering uh, um, uh, them to take action and stop the stop progress. Don't proceed in the face of uncertainty. Um, and so, they, they used and developed tools such as the famous checklist that we always hear about. Um, they standardized uh, their, their um, uh, approach to processes. No longer was it relying on merely the pilot to, to defer to all the decision making. And it's resulted in a dramatic uh, change if you look at the data over the course of the decades to where um, it's considered to be the safest mode of public transportation. And so um, how does that relate to healthcare? In 1999, uh, Institute of Medicine um, published To Air as Human, which was uh, dramatic at the time. It estimated about 100,000 lives are lost every year to medical error in the United States. That turns out to be that was an underestimate. So that should have been our tipping point to uh, adopt these uh, processes, but we've been slow as an industry. Uh, to date, only about 25% of hospitals are embarking on the high reliability journey. Dr. Chasen uh, the, of the Joint Commission uh, has stated that the most successful hospitals have three things. They have leadership's commitment to zero preventable harm. They have uh, develop a commitment to develop a culture where it's safe to raise concerns and to, and to surface uh, errors. And to, to then the, the final thing is to have a robust process improvement so that we can learn from those errors and those errors aren't compounded or repeated. We, in our orientation for every new employee, have an introduction to high reliability. And within the first three months, we require them to um, attend a formal didactic two-hour training. Um, and then on our annual refreshers every year, we have an, another um, set of slides that uh, reminds us of uh, the culture that we aim for and the tools that uh, um, we want to standardize and embed in our culture. And the next slide will show, uh, I just want to orient you to this. This is, we talked about process uh, uh, process improvement. We believe that the best people to know their processes and where things need to be are the frontline people. And so this is an example of boards that are on all of our units that are designed for continuous process improvement. And I'll just walk you through from left to right. There are different sections of the board. The stoplight vertical section there um, is a way for frontline staff to surface any concerns they have. And they might be safety concerns, they might be operational concerns. Um, we promote having briefs at the beginning of the shift where the team gets together and talks about any safety issues, challenges for the day, goals of the day, um, and then a debrief at the end of the shift where they can go over what went well, but also so where are our opportunities? What workarounds did we have to um, uh, employ today? What, 
what equipment was not working, what processes need to be looked into, and they put suggestions or concerns up in that red section. That alerts the director or manager of that unit when they come in to know what their what their staff is facing and what their concerns were. And the goal is to within three days to to communicate uh, on those little slips what their actions are. And they move that down into the yellow so the staff knows that their their concerns are being addressed and how they're being addressed. And then ultimately, when they feel that it, that um, that concern was fixed, they put it in the green. And we'd like it to stay in the green for at least 30 days so that we know that the fix was sustainable. And then once a month, two of the executive uh, leadership team members round on each of these boards and talk with the staff. And we look at those ones in green and say, it looks like this was fixed. Do you really think so? Um, does everyone agree? And if they do, they get a gold star and that gets logged in a book and comes off. So it, staff can then see that their concerns are being addressed when they raise something it's being taken seriously and it's it's resulting in a better working environment if if uh, they may say that uh, they're not you know it, it was fixed for a little while but now it's back again and then we we put that back up in the red and uh, allow the director to take another uh, chance at it the middle section is what we call our uh uh, learn, um, uh lean daily management board and so we have key performance indicators on there. And so these, the senior executive team rounds with the staff uh, every day and every morning, um, the the A member of a staff walks us through their goals. And so you see there are three of them up there. Everyone has a safety goal, that's the S. Um, there can be a quality goal, an inventory goal, or a delivery goal that they choose. These are metrics that there's not an obvious fix for it. We're not sure exactly what the problem is, but there's a problem here. And the, the staff themselves choose it. It's not a top-down driven. And it may be that they don't, they don't get lunch and let's track some data. Um, it may be that there's a safety issue um, or they don't, they don't have what they need when they need it, so it's an inventory issue. And so the idea is they put a very clear goal up there and then it's marked red or yellow for the previous 24 hours. We come by, if it's marked red on that top one, then the second sheet is just merely how many incidents incidents um, did that happen, of that they did not meet their goal. And then the most important one is that third sheet that I know you can't read, but it, it has all of the reasons. It's a Pareto chart. You know, what? why didn't we meet our goal that day? And eventually you collect data over time, it results in a bar chart. And, and uh, whichever the longest one is, should get our attention to, to dig deeper in that last um, sheet on there, you see there's the five whys. So that's one, maybe our, there's our opportunity and it may have been what we predicted and sometimes it's actually uh, um, the data is showing us something new that we didn't expect to be the problem. And so then we wanna dig deep into the five whys and there is a principle of high reliability of, uh, of reluctance to simplify. So we don't just take the first obvious reason, we, we continue to ask why until we think we get to the root cause. So this is data-driven decision-making. Um, and then the final um, column you see that says quality that's blank on these boards. These are non-clinical boards we gave you an example of, but all of our clinical units in this section have uh, a safety checklist on it. And so the safety checklist is something that someone is has ownership of every day, walking through the first thing in the morning, walking through the environment as if you were a joint commission surveyor, looking for any safety issues um, and that uh, that may have. And then that has a bar chart too. So the most frequent safety issue becomes apparent with a quick glance at the board. And uh, the, the, the top of the board you see our keys to, to success that we've chosen at our hospital is safety, quality, empathy, and respect. Not one without the other, but in that order. So if anyone is uncertain about what to do, they should have their guiding uh, prism that they, they make their decision through as safety first. And if they're not sure, they don't proceed in the face of uncertainty and they um, need to get a cross check or um, you know validate um, their decision making. Okay, I think that's, yeah. So the next one is an, another tool that we use. Um, as I said, in the morning, we, we, we have every unit has a, a a brief of their own. In that brief, they go over um, safety concerns for the day and situational awareness, but also uh, any high reliability, any staffing issues, 
and then uh, a representative from that group is uh, present at this 915 organizational safety brief that we have every day, seven days a week. It's run by the senior leadership member uh, team uh, that's on call. And we start at the very top with any high reliability recognition. And there are often examples of people using the tools called ARC and IPASS and SBAR. Um, we we uh, allow, um, you know, encourage any kind of teamwork recognition in this section. Um, and we frequently get three or four or five uh, throughout the organization. And then the, going down, we talk about what are significant safety issues facing the organization. And so that everyone has situational awareness. Another uh, principle of uh, high reliability is sensitivity to operations. And here there's a, a large group, there's probably 20 to 30 people on this every day. Um, so they have a, a situational awareness. It's also a preoccupation with failure, what might happen, and so that everyone knows. And um, and then what you can't see, because it's a little cut off on that screenshot, is, is you start going down through every department uh, reports out. So the emergency department, all the clinical departments go first, but in addition, you see education and IT on there and EVS and facilities and safety and security and quality all report out uh, on um, any kind of issues that they have. And then um, if there's any needs, we put them in these follow up items if something is not uh, immediately fixable. And so this is uh, another principle of high reliability is commitment to resilience. So we want to close the loop and make sure that um, things that are brought up are um, or errors that that may have happened that we look into it, figure out why and fix it so it doesn't happen again. Um, there's a there's an estimate that once high reliability is embedded in an organization that over the course of two years, uh, their significant safety events um, can drop by uh, eighty percent. And we see, you know, from the airline industry and the nuclear power uh, industry that um, uh, adoption of these standardized tools um, allows for persistent uh, uh, success in operation without significant uh, errors. You know, uh, Jonathan mentioned our goal is to become a five-star uh, hospital. This is uh, predominantly a uh, our main tool that we think will get us there. Um, and the we're not where we want to be. Our grades right now reflect uh, the um, culture and operations that were happening about two years ago, one and a half to two years ago in 2019 and 20. And you can see from this um, data set that uh, hospital acquired infections, we had uh, um, too many of them. Um, from different types of infection are, are not as important, but um, you can see when our high reliability journey started, you can see that we're trending in the right direction. Um, the next slide will show hospital acquired conditions, and it's just an exam one example, which is falls. The top are the total number of falls, and then you have falls with injury as the bottom line. Um, again, um, trending in the right direction. And then um, the last slide that I have here, I believe, is the uh, hand hand hygiene. We had an organizational safety. Uh, I'm sorry, organizational um, um, goal to improve improve our uh, hand hygiene, and this shows what can happen when you develop a shared vision. You you have transparency of uh, of data frequently. You employ um, um, the principles of coaching, uh, being willing to be coached uh, yourselves and uh, teamwork um, with signage, lots of different strategies, but we've moved it uh, in the course of one year, 20%. Um, it's not um, where we want it to be yet, but um, this is an example of working together with a shared vision and a common goal to try to um, improve the safety for our uh, patients. And I believe uh, the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie Bro, our Chief Financial Officer, thank you. Thank you. Um, so now I have to try to unmute and talk and advance slides at the same time. So we'll see how it goes, but I, I, I'm going to try. <laughs> um, so this first slide here, really just to kick us off, I'm going to walk us through our net patient revenue and just an overall summary of our budget request. So whenever we, you know, kind of embark on our budget process for the year, we have to look at our current year budget um, as a starting point. So in this case, our approved current fiscal year net patient revenue budget was 115.9 million. That's that top number. And then we have to ask ourselves the question about physician transfers. 
So did we have any physician transfers into the hospital or out of the hospital that would um, require us to really adjust the starting point? And in our case, we did. And we're gonna talk about these physician transfers um, in some bigger detail in the next few slides. But in our case, we had uh, several physician transfers out of the hospital. So we reduced our uh, starting point by 4.4 million. So our adjusted starting point this year was um, a net patient revenue of 111.5 million. And then we go always to the Green Mountain Care Board budget guidance um, that you all provide to us. And in this case, um, the maximum allowable growth was 8.6%. So 8.6% is that $9.6 million number. And we know that the uh, fiscal year 23 net patient revenue cap is 121.1 million. And so that is the cap. And you will see that the budget that we have submitted today is just under that cap. Uh, overall, NMC is asking for a 9.4% rate increase. And we plan to apply that rate increase as 11.01% to our hospital-based services and a 0% uh, rate increase or <clears throat> charge increase to our outpatient professional fees. So this means, um, and we've done this for several years, we feel it's really important um, for our patients to be able to go see a specialist or you know, a primary care physician and have an office visit and to have the prices of those services. Um, and remain at you know what we feel is a fair and affordable level. So we do that on purpose, intentionally and strategically. So we plan to do 11% uh, on the hospital side and 0% on our professional fees. So that is just a kind of an overview, a high level view of our net patient revenue and our budget request. So one of the physician transfers that I wanna to talk to you about is uh, regarding pediatrics. So uh, Northwestern employed um, two pediatric practices, so one in St. Albans and one in the town of Enosburg. And on January 1st of this year, we transitioned those practices to private practice. So those practices still exist in our community. They're still serving patients in our community, and they now are under the name of Monarch Maples Pediatrics. So what this did, this transition actually allowed um, the hospital to improve access uh, for our community for pediatric care. Because before, um, when we had the practices were employed by us, we had providers who were trying to you know, run a clinic. They had an outpatient clinic that was extremely busy. These were very productive um, providers. And so at the same time, they were trying to provide coverage for newborns um, and for other inpatient pediatric care happening here at the hospital. So their time was you know, constantly trying to be split. They were also on call every day. We had to have a provider on call. And so really we had kind of these um, overworked, quite frankly, and, and just not a sustainable model for pediatrics. So when those uh, practices transitioned to private practice, NMC implemented a physician-led pediatric nurse practitioner team to really take care of those inpatient pediatric needs. So now we have uh, wonderful providers that are providing care uh, outpatient in their practices. And then if we have newborns or we have uh, inpatient pediatrics come in through the emergency department or they send over a kiddo who needs inpatient services, we have a hospital-based uh, pediatric team that is here and able to care for those patients. Uh, it's still early, that program is still early for us. And so I know January seems like a long time ago, but we're still you know, maturing that program, but the early results um, we're gonna go over those soon, and it is showing that we are absolutely meeting a community need there. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Pam Parsons, who's gonna talk to us about our other uh, physician transfer around primary care. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, as you know, I'm Pam Parsons. I've been the CEO uh, at uh, Notch for the last 20 plus years. 
uh, it became an FQHC actually in that in Franklin and Grand Isle back in 2002. Um, early in uh, 2001, uh, 2021, I should say, uh, we did have conversations with the hospital uh, about primary care. That's an area that we uh, is our focus: primary care, dental care, behavioral health. Um, and the discussion came around there to primary care practices. And by working with our two boards working together and and the uh, management team, uh, and there's lots of pieces that have to come together to actually transfer practices, uh, staffing and patients. Uh, we accomplished it by May 2nd and uh, it's operating quite well. It, it gives us now um, eight, eight uh, primary care offices. Our commitment is in the rural area. So we have offices in Elberg, Richford, Enosburg, Swanton, and and I want to say that we're very dependent on a hospital in our area. Uh, we need the services. We we use their uh, lab services. Um, it's thirty miles to the hospital from the farthest point of some of our patients, and and um, grateful of the work that they do do. Um, you can go to the next slide, Stephanie. Putting this together and working, two organizations working together, it's important that as management changes and board changes that we develop a, a strong agreement that is continue, continues over the years. And that was a conversation that I, the Notch and NMC board uh, had and committed to. So we've created this joint steering committee. We'll be meeting quarterly, and 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 admin can talk in between those quarterly meetings about other opportunities. But looking at our community as a team, you know, what do we need? Uh, what do our patients need? What can we do um, to help? Uh, um, manage our patients. Uh, it, it's there's there's plenty of work to do, and if we can share some of uh, our resources so that um, uh, we take care of our patients and have the right formula, uh, I think it's important. It takes time. I think having the joint steering committee gives us confidence that this isn't just a one time, that it is ongoing and we can look at other opportunities um, down the road and we expect we will. Um, I, back to you, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, so now we're gonna move into our profit and loss. So here's a look at our P&L um, and we have both the current year projection and next year's budget on here. So I'm gonna start over on the right with the 2022 projection. Um, so like Jonathan mentioned in the beginning of our presentation, we do expect to have a loss uh, from operations in the current year. And right, and this shows at the time we put this together, that was 1.2 million. Uh, we actually think we're gonna come in um, you know, higher on traveler expense. So I anticipate that our overall uh, net loss for the current year will be around $2 million or just over $2 million. Um, those numbers are getting a little easier to predict now that we only have a couple months to go. And then moving over to our 2023 budget column, um, you can see that the net income from operations is 1.2 million. So for Northwestern, that is a 1% operating margin. And again, our goal in the long term uh, is to have a 3% operating margin. Uh, this is a look at our balance sheet. Uh, again, current year projection and next year's budget. Um, we're going to talk in a minute uh, when we look at the cash flow statement about this uh, decrease you're seeing for current assets. 
um, that would be a decrease in cash, but there are no uh, significant changes um, in any of these categories from year to year. And I think it's always just helpful to point out that, you know, NMC does not have any plans to issue any new debt or take on, you know, any new debt agreement. So, and here is that cash flow statement that I was talking about. Um, you will see that beginning cash of 77 million and ending cash of 75. So we are actually projecting it to go down. So that is intentional um, and it really has to do with the number in the middle there, which says uh, cash used by the purchase of property, plant and equipment of 11.3 million. So 5.8 million of that is going to be routine capital replacements and the rest is going to be uh, capital expenditures related to our approved certificate of need, which is an emergency department renovation. So again, cash is going down. That is not usually what you look for as a CFO. In this case, it has been uh, planned and known for, for several years. So that is what we believe our cash flow statement will look like. And I'm gonna turn it uh, back over to Jonathan, who's gonna talk about equity. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, you folks asked about our work in equity and I appreciate that question because it's something that the organization feels strongly about, and it's something that I'm personally passionate about. Um, NMC has identified advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as a strategic priority. Um, it is on our strategic plan. It's part of our engagement pillar, um, but it blurs over into the quality pillar um, as well, because we intend to address it both as an employer, but also as a care provider. Um, there are concerning issues out there on both fronts that need to be addressed, um, some of which we have begun to become familiar with, and others likely we have not yet uncovered um, and we can't even see in front of ourselves. Um, it is flowing into our annual operating plan, and we are in the process right now of um, going through the final selection of a DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion partner to help guide our efforts. We're building on the sparks lit by Dr. Avila, um, a national speaker with Vermont Ties, um, who lit some embers for us before the pandemic that we have carried forward in very small and fledgling ways. Um, uh, I don't wanna overstate what we're doing, but let me give you a feel um, we have become active in our account accountable communities for health work locally, and they're carrying a statewide focus on equity. Um, we've incorporated diversity into our new patient family advisory group. Um, we are, we have done some initial work with the Abnaki Nation. Um, we're collaborating with Notch on some outreach. Uh, we reshaped our approach to our community health needs assessment to be more accessible and more driven um, by the people rather than pure um, administrative data. Um, but again, it's, it's fledgling and I'm honestly humbled um, by the fact that I feel our organization and our industry um, is late getting to this work. And as I shared that thought with one of our um, potential partners, he pointed out to me that clearly the best time to plant a shade tree is 20 years ago, and the next best time to plant it is today. And so we have humbly embraced that and embarking going forward. Um, and so this is a point of emphasis for us. I look forward to next year. Um, I hope you have continued interest in this aspect of hospital operation and being able to come back and report more to you on it at, the, at that point. Um, you also asked about wait times. And again, this is another um, compelling topic for the hospital, for our community. Um, our wait times are not where we would like them. And yet they, they do compare favorably with some uh, benchmarks that are out there and yet that just like our quality scores, they're not um, acceptable to us as we move forward. Um, you'll see here in this data that for common imaging procedures, 
um, access for within one month is at 49%. Um, we would be much more comfortable with that number being at or a little above 80%, that it would be reasonable um, for us to target getting four out of our five folks who need um, a common imaging procedure um, through that study within a month. Similarly, for our specialty practices, we're at about 40% within one month right now, and we need to strengthen access to specialty services um, so that 80% of folks who need to see a specialist can see that specialist within a month. And so those are our goals as an organization. We've begun to work on this. Um, we've done some really strong work within uh, diagnostic imaging, particularly around mammography, to boost the number of available slots to the community and to pull people forward. If you go to the NMC website, you'll see that there is a pop-up as soon as you get to the website that announces to our community that additional um, availability is possible and it helps pull people forward, uh, getting good traction on that. So this is an area of attention to us, um, but and it ties to the workforce issues. It ties to the capacity issues that we talk about as with the burdens on the hospital, um, but it represents both a risk and an opportunity for us. Um, this is not a way to run a hospital. It's a way to frustrate a community. It's a way to get in the way of good patient care. And so it's a risk. But as we look at this with good uh, business practices and proper resources, we can indeed change this story significantly, and that's an opportunity. And with that, it flows directly into your questions about risks and opportunities, and I'll let Stephanie speak to those. Okay, so for me, um, I think this is always the toughest section of the presentation. Um, and this year, I feel like it was even tougher and I feel like that's just kind of a result of, you know, the, the environment we're in right now, which is just changing so fast. Um, and I know that you've heard that from other, you know, CEOs and CFOs, um, and it's no different from us. So when I think, so I just, I just jotted a few. The point is I probably could have listed dozens. Um, for me, you know, first and foremost, I think these first two um, are the, the greatest risk to our budget. Uh, actually, I lumped the first two together. So any uh, negative financial impacts of COVID and any negative financial impacts of continued capacity issues are not built into the budget. So if we have a COVID surge, um, if we end up with uh, other capacity issues, maybe it still continues to be subacute patients is our challenge. Uh, we end up canceling surgeries again. We end up canceling other, um, you know, non-emergent or elective services. Those things are not built into this budget. And of course, if one or both of those things happen, um, then we will do what we need to do. Um, but just to be clear that they weren't factored in. So that's kind of, I, I lump those two together and say that's the first one. Um, and then the second one we've already talked about, it's our reliance on travelers. Um, we are going to come in over $11 million of expense. We have budgeted for $8.6 million of expense, which is still a lot. It is, it is much, much higher than anything that I would like for it to be, um, but it's almost a 25% reduction. So we have to take a meaningful uh, bite out of that apple. Uh, in fiscal year 23 and move in the right direction from a recruitment and retention standpoint. Uh, I also have in here uh, as a risk is that inflation is higher than what we budgeted. Uh, so we budgeted for overall um, inflation in our expenses of about 8.86%. And much of that inflation is being felt now, it's in our projections, it's in our current year financial statements, but when you look budget to budget, um, it's about an 8.86% increase associated with inflation. Um, and so if it comes in higher than that, then you know that would be a risk to this budget. Um, there's also some opportunities, and for NMC, these are really program and service related opportunities. So we have a tele-ICU program, which is a partnership with Dartmouth. And that program is not new, but it is still uh, becoming fully mature. 
And we also have our inpatient pediatric uh, program that I spoke to earlier that is still uh, ramping up and becoming mature as well. So I think growth uh, in those two programs is an opportunity. And then NMC does uh, have a telestroke partnership also with Dartmouth, and we will be going live with that program on September 1st. So we have built some of these things into our budget, but to the extent that we can mature those programs and grow them more than what we have put in, put in the budget, that is a potential opportunity. Um, I also want to mention here, um, just to be fully transparent when I talk about uh, what is in and out of the budget. I know you've already heard that the final uh, Medicare rule did come in more favorable than the proposed Medicare rule that we used to build our budget. Um, so for NMC, the impact of that is uh, 184,000. So there's there's a 184,000 um, opportunity that that should be something we can count on. Uh, I have here just to those first two programs that are already live. I just wanted to give you an idea of what we have already seen um, for growth and what we're planning. So these, uh, this graph shows you our ICU patient days. So since going live with our tele-ICU program with Dartmouth, you can see where we were at in 2019 and 2020 and where we've been able to grow um, in 2021, 2022, and what we're anticipating for 2023. So that has been a very valuable um, growth for our community to be able to, to provide more ICU services. And then this is a very small um, chunk of data at the time we put this presentation together. Um, our pediatric uh, nurse practitioner team was just getting off the ground. And so we took, um, at the time we put this together, we took the most recent month and said, how many inpatient pediatric days did we have? And how does that compare, that same time frame compare to the prior year? So again, still very early. I wouldn't um, you know, say that we've that we've budgeted for that level or that we're we've kind of matured this program. Absolutely not, but we're just keeping an eye on it and we're hopeful that that there'll be some growth there. Uh, Value-based care participation. So our budget does include full participation. Uh, in the One Care uh, program for 2023. So Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. Uh, capital investment uh, plans, going back to this a little bit, um, our routine capital budget is uh, has been established at 5.8 million for 2023. And I've given you uh, just a flavor of what that includes by showing you what our top five items are. Um, but I can tell you that as our priorities change and as our environment changes, we may substitute some of these things out. Um, well, we always have conversations with our board, um, but we will stick to the 5.8 million as an overall budget. <clears throat> and then uh, updating aging infrastructure. This is really a second capital slide. So we have an approved certificate of need for a renovation of our emergency department. Um, updating that infrastructure really is about safety and it really is about quality. Um, it's not just about having the organization look nice. Um, and what you have here is a picture of our current emergency department. So you can see all the curtain bay areas. And so this renovation will move us to private rooms. Um, the current ED was built over 40 years ago. And so we, every day we have significant issues with privacy and with infection control. Um, and so we very much appreciate the approval and look forward to uh, renovating that space. And I'm gonna let Jonathan uh, finish us up. All right, thank you, Steph. Um, in conclusion, let me say this. Um, I am deeply proud of the entire NMC team, uh, the care we provide to our community, our focus on continuous improvement, and the tireless effort of this team to meet community need in the face of overcapacity on a regular basis. And we're also grateful for the work and efforts and support of our community partners. Um, Franklin County is indeed a village here in Northwestern Vermont with Grand Isle and our surrounding areas. And the hospital can't do it alone. And we're grateful 
uh, for our community support and our partners. Um, I will tell you frankly that our community board and our leadership team fully understand the significance of a 9.4% rate increase. That's why we held our margin to 1%. And it's why we kept our revenue within the cap that the Green Mountain Care Board provided. We hope that you will find, as our community board did, that this is a reasonable and responsible request. Um, we thank you for your attention um, and thank you for, for making this work on this virtual platform, the awkwardness of the, the Hollywood Squares or the Brady Bunch. Um, rather actually be with you in person um, so that we can actually see each other as we go. But do appreciate the efficiency of this and the ability to do it despite whatever COVID might be doing. So thank you for that. And with that, we would be happy to answer any questions uh, folks have. Great, thank you, Jonathan and team. Um, really clear presentation and some inspiring work here. I, I just wanna say before I turn it over to the board for questions that I really appreciate your quality and reliability journey and your efforts to improve equity and access. It seems like you're making very intentional and consequential data-driven culture shifts. And I would just note that I think change is always hard in normal circumstances, but you're trying to make these significant changes during a pandemic with workforce shortages and provider burnout. So just want to acknowledge that I, I can only imagine how difficult it is, but how important it is and it's very inspirational. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to kick it over to uh, board member Robin Lunge. Thanks, Jess. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you. And uh, I was fortunate enough to see you in person not all that long ago. Um, thanks again for the invite to your community meeting. Um, I do want to say before I jump into questions that the quality work is really interesting and exciting. And uh, I'm very interested to learn how that journey goes for you. Um, so thanks for sharing that information. Uh, my first question, uh, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about um, your utilization assumptions in the budget. I think your narrative said that you were basing it on um, your early, your volume information earlier in fiscal year 22. Um, and certainly you've talked about the capacity issues and, and the high volumes that you've been experiencing uh, more recently. Uh, but then I also note that of the 9.6, let's call it NPR request, it looks like about 6.7 million of that is attributable to the rate. So could you uh, kind of reconcile those two things for me? Yeah, I can start and, and Devin or others can feel free to jump in if I miss something. But yeah, I mean, we always start, you know, February, March, um, you know, things really get going in April, but we we try to take a rolling 12, you know, say in March, we try to take a rolling 12 months and look at our volumes and say, okay, because if you do a rolling 12, you get some of that seasonality in there, right? And yeah. then we do, uh, you know, we meet with all of the clinical or revenue generating department managers and directors, and we say, you know, what don't we know? What's going to change? What's going to make things go up and down? Um, we look at all of our employed um, physicians and we actually say, how many surgeries are you going to do? How many office days are you going to do? Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a detailed process, but, you know, really for us, um, we're able to kind of identify those changes in order to come up with all of our changes in utilization. And I would say that the notable things that were not, you know, a lot of a lot of them end up rolling forward in a way that's pretty similar. Um, and I would say that the ones that were not pretty similar were probably our lab. Um, and so that's one area. And uh, orthopedics was the other area. So we knew, um, last year when we were putting together the budget for the current year that we had vacancies in orthopedics um, and so our hope and plan is to be able to fill those vacancies and allow us to bring on some additional um, orthopedic revenue and you know i think in terms of other utilization changes from the time we prepared the budget i would say um, the emergency department um, and our inpatient has definitely um, 
they're running hotter than maybe they were when we went and put the budget together. On the flip side, you know, that has caused us to cancel some surgeries. And so what I'm what I'm projecting for the current year for surgery revenues is actually lower than what I'm going to be um, projecting for next year. So, um, yeah, not unlike anybody else, uh, we've got already some areas where it's not quite what we thought it was back in February or March, but we have things going in each direction. And I don't know if Devin wants to add anything to that, but. Yeah, I think that's a, a good description. And, um, you know, we anticipate this question and the need to break those pieces apart uh, for for this setting. And so um, everything Stephanie described results in our initial budget at a 0% rate increase. And then that's what we work with. And then any change from, you know, the net patient revenue that's calculated there, the change to the final submission is the dollar amount we know that we're attributing to the rate and it's isolated to the rate. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could, if you had, ex we've heard from a couple hospitals um, that they experienced quite a downturn with the Omicron surge, um, which sounded primarily for the most part due to staff vacancy, you know, staff being out sick. I was wondering if that was something that you all saw up in St. Albans or uh, the two hospitals who've mentioned it happen to be in the southern part of the state. So I'm just a little curious about whether that's consistent across hospitals or we're seeing some regionality there or or what your experience was. Dr. Benadeo can help me on this one, but I think our experience was consistent to what you just described. Go ahead, Dr. Benadeo. Yeah. Yes, our, um, we have not been challenged with uh, um, significant inpatient uh, uh, hospitalizations for COVID with with Omicron. Um, we have been more challenged with community acquired uh, staffing challenges. Um, um, so, you know, our, our peak um, was some time ago. So we, we've been averaging kind of, you know, in the in the below five. Uh, it, inpatient census for COVID for many months now. But it doesn't sound like that had a sort of dramatic impact on your volumes during that period of time. Correct. It didn't Thanks. have a dramatic impact on the volumes, but it does impact our staffing. That yeah. We've, we've gone from being COVID driven to being COVID complicated. Uh -huh. that, that, okay, well, who's calling out today and how do we patch that as opposed to the terrifying days early in the pandemic of, do we have enough ventilators? Um, sure. So there's still an impact, but it's not the dramatic inpatient. Got it. Thank you. Um, so in terms, the other question that I wanted to, let me just check something here, but I think I got a you already answered a couple of my other questions that I had marked from the materials. Um, in terms of the provider transfers, um, so it looks like in this provider transfer schedule for um, the primary care that's transferred um, to Notch, that overall for the hospital, uh, that netted out as an operating loss when you had the the primary care. So it's showing your net patient revenue as being about 2.6 million, but the expenses associated with that service at being 3.8, resulting in like a 1.3 loss. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then with the PEDS, uh, similarly, not quite the same numbers, but um, it looks similar. What I'm wondering about is in the Schedule A for the PEDS, do you reflect somewhere kind of the offset of the inpatient pediatric that you've retained? Yeah. Yeah. And again, Devin can jump in, but we did know um, with pediatrics that it wasn't as, as straightforward because we established the inpatient pediatric nurse practitioner team. So we tried to estimate um, the net patient revenue associated with that group coming on board to offset it in that physician transfer schedule. Okay, great. I, I couldn't couldn't quite tell if it was in there, so I wanted to just ask so I knew what I was looking at. Um, okay, I think those were my areas that I just wanted to explore a little bit. Thank you very much. 
Great, thank you. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to board member Pelham. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to applaud you for submitting a budget that has a operating expense increase of just 5.5% and an NPR FFP increase, you know, of just 4.5%. Um, I'm and, and to have done it in such a thoughtful way. Um, it's I'm I'm sure there's a lot of heavy lifting there that we'll never know about. Um, my first question was um, in the narrative, uh, it was mentioned in, in, in the, in the uh, income statement that you were uh, putting in uh, risk reserves of $1,125,000 for both Medicare and Medicaid um, in the 2023 budget. I'm getting tired here. I'm going to be saying things. 2023 uh, 20, uh, budget. Um, and I'm just wondering why, because you didn't do it last year, you did it this year. And I'm wondering, especially relative to Medicaid, where there is no reconciliation, you know, um, required, you know, why, why you built those reserves into this budget? What kind of risks are you thinking about? So I tried to, you know, work with the one care team to figure out, um, you know, is the is the risk reserve that we're experiencing now going to be the same in 2023? Or are we looking at a big increase or a change in those risk reserves? Um, and so, as you know, around timing of when those contracts are due and when we're going through budget preparation and now going through budget presentations, we don't we don't have an answer. We're flying blind a little bit because um, they don't they don't have it figured out quite yet. But I've got to get a budget submitted, and so you know we used the best information they could give us. But it it did look like there was going to be an additional um, risk component to the organization, and then and then I always go back and forth of do I do I include that in the budget submission or do I not? Right? Because when when I'm putting together um, a budget packet and it says what is your balance sheet balance is going to be on September 30 of 2023 I, I want to give you exactly what it's going to be right but I also don't want to fund any changes in risk associated with one care with a rate increase request because then I'm not taking risk um, and so you know what I can tell you is that if I had not changed those risk reserve levels the balance sheet number I gave you would have been wrong, I think. Um, but I can tell you, had I not done that, the rate increase request would be the same. We probably would have we would have showed a little bit of a higher margin, still less than three percent, you know, yeah. a little yeah. bit of a higher margin. But we would we would still be here um, presenting a budget with with the same rate increase request. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> my next question has to do with. Um, I can see here that in the uh, in the paramix tables, um, it looks like for Medicaid, you're profiling budget over budget, a 3.4% increase. Um, and if you kind of factor out that reserve, it would be a 10.7% increase. And I'm just wondering what it is that makes you think that either of those uh, Medicaid growth numbers uh, is something that will happen. What's the risk that it won't happen? Um, Devin, do you want to take this one? Well, there's a couple parts to that question. I think the first is on how did we get those numbers? And then second, what's the, the risk assessment on those? Um, and, you know, the, the values that are there are driven by that baseline period, um, which is the best information that we have, you know, Budgeting in a post COVID world is like starting over and learning how to budget. Um, and so it, there's naturally more risk this time around, as there was last year, um, to these numbers. The best information we have um, is the run rate, you know, of this, you know, post COVID world for a, you know, our new normal. I won't say post COVID, but. Um, so, so that that's how that's arrived at is because that's what we've been seeing. Um, you know, some of those utilization changes Stephanie mentioned, uh, service lines do have their own payer mix, which gets factored in. So as we boost some of those, uh, you know, orthopedic and uh, service lines and lab, those may have a, a higher mix towards towards Medicare, Medicaid. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my next question has to do with uh, the travelers. And um, so you're looking at um, a budgeting of 8.7 million um, in 2023. And I'm just wondering how that relates to budgeting for regular positions underneath. Is that 8.7 on top or is this making some assumptions about your permanent employees and regular employees? And then that 8.7 um, million will cover the full load of the travelers. Yeah, so what we do is we say, okay, is $8.7 million going to, you know, buy us 25 travelers? Is it, so, you know, we, we decide the number of FTEs um, that we think are going to be staffed by travelers. And then we determine what we think the traveler rate is going to be, which we have seen come down a bit, um, which is the good news. And so we budgeted at that lower level um, because we have seen it come down from its peak. And then, you know, once we have our traveler budget established, we take that number of traveler FTEs and figure out what, if they were regular employees, what the salary and benefit components would be that we would have paid. And we back that amount out of those lines so that we're not like double dipping or double budgeting. Um, if we end up coming in way under budget on our travelers, I mean, nothing would make me happier than to come in over budget on my salaries and wages because of that. Um, but we would have an offsetting variance because we try, we try to, you know, like I said, take take one out of the other, even though one is much more expensive. So uh, this is uh, a, so this is a question that is probably I could probably answer it, but you know, given the pressure of travelers and the the pressure on the budget from them um there is money kind of you know, directed toward them and at some point we hope and as you just expressed that that goes away um and so if it does go away um would you um would you kind of think that ratepayers should benefit a little bit from that and that the hospital should be able to kind of then reinvest uh, uh, some of that traveler money um, into things the hospital needs. I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to think two or three years down the line. I know it's a fanciful thought, but um, it's a lot of money. Yeah, so I think it depends, right? Like how much did we beat, did we beat that number by, right? If I beat that number by a million or, you know, and, and what happens with all of the other expense lines of the budget? So did inflation not come in higher than what we thought it was going to be? And we really beat our traveler budget. Um, or did we really beat it? But, you know, COVID surge happened again. Hospital capacity issues continued, had to cancel surgeries. Inflation came in higher. So I think it depends what else is going on um, mm -hmm. and the magnitude of the dollar amount. But I can tell you that, um, you know, the only way, because you guys have allowed an 8.6% net patient revenue growth for two years, and we're using it all in year one, we all know in this organization, especially at our senior, senior leadership team and our board level, we all know that the path to a viable budget in 2024 is to get that traveler number from 8.7 million down to four or 5 million, because that's where our operating margin is gonna come from the next year. Um, so we have a very um, intentional, specific schedule of like, okay, here's how we have to ramp these down and it goes by month. Um, and, you know, here are the milestones that we need to hit in order to stay on track with this. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's a very fair question. Two more questions. Um, one is that you, I think I could be wrong, but in terms of these hearings, you're the first hospital to reference the 8.6% uh, guideline. Um, and uh, and I applaud you for that. Um, and I understand your rationale. I mean, it's kind of a fixed perspective, you know, cap. But other hospitals, you know, aren't referencing it. And so uh, what happens if, if we approve your budget as requested um, and we approve other budgets that um, uh, exceed the guidelines, what would Northwestern's 
I mean, what, what do you think your, your board would think about that? Because it might be a tension that we're going to have to face. I'll start, and then we have a board member here who can jump in. Um, but I think, you know, I, I really truly believe that every hospital asks for what they need. Um, and we always want to hit the guidance. We always want to follow the rules. Um, and so for us, you know, going over 8.6% so that we could have more than a 1% margin and would jump our rate increase request into double digits, we just couldn't do it, right? That's just not what we wanted to do for Vermonters and our patients and our community, for ourselves as an organization. We wanted to feel like we were going to own some of the, you know, the state of, you know, the healthcare in Vermont that we all find ourselves in right now. Um, and so it really, you know, was a budget based on need. I think everybody says, and so you guys do not have a easy task um, of trying to determine that everybody's budget is based on need. But I think we would still feel um, satisfied, happy, and content that we put forth a budget that really was what we needed. Um, and I can let Jake chime in. Thank you, Stephanie. This is uh, Jake Kohlschneider, uh, the board um, board president. So, uh, you know, we wouldn't go to Stephanie and say, "Hey, you didn't ask for for you know for enough." That's not really the way we we think. Um, I I I believe we ask for what we need, and I believe that if you did approve for others, um, uh, what went over that eight six, that we would probably try to look for the reasons why and where they're extenuating circumstances that for certain hospitals that you decided that it was okay or it made sense um, because I'm sure that it, it wouldn't just be done without a very specific reason that we would understand um, and I think most would look at it that way and not look to come back next year and get our share of what we didn't ask for I think we're always going to ask for what we think we need even if it's if it if it's over your guidance, I can tell you we would make a very compelling reason as to why, and it'd be very thoughtful and purposeful. So, I hope that answers your question. Well, no, I uh, thank thank you for for that frankness. Um, and I will tell you, Mr. Pelham, that it's not the first time that question's been asked. Our own hospital staff in our own hallways have asked us as they've seen different things come out in the media yeah. of why we did what we did. And they've understood the answer as Stephanie and Jake have presented it. And so I think these two have represented us really well, but it's not the first time we've had to answer that question. So I appreciate you asking it. Well, it's a tough place to be. I, I, I can appreciate it, but uh, thank you for being there. Um, and my last question is just one that uh, kind of gnaws at me, and I don't know if there's a basis for it or not. Um, but one of the reports that was uh, referenced in the supplemental uh, that was sent out was the reimbursement um, variation report that uh, we did uh, last um, last spring. And in there, there were uh, um, I went and looked at it uh, the other day, and there were 32 pr procedures that were covered in it, 19 of which were included Northwestern. And of the 19, uh, UVMMC's median reimbursements were higher than Northwestern's across all 19. A couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> one would be vaginal delivery at Northwestern. The median was $5,957. And at U, at the, U, the medical center, it was $14,800. For a colonoscopy with a legion, Removal, it was 2,144 at Northwestern and 5,957 um, at uh, the medical center. Um, and just one more here, an MRI spine, um, uh, an MRI of the spine, Northwestern was uh, uh, $1,877 and uh, the medical center was um, uh, $3,999. So my question is, is that should this variation and be a concern of the boards, this board, when considering budgets, or do you think the current marketplace is accurately reflecting reasonable outcomes? A big question. 
I think, um, and you know, again, anyone else can chime in from my team. Um, I think when we look at the supplemental data, that was that was part of it, and I think we put this in our narrative. I do think that our payments or our net revenue, whatever the the proper term is, is understated. You know, I think we, you know, what you're seeing for numbers, I think, are is a little bit understated, and that's just me being completely honest and transparent. Um, we would have to go through it, you know, kind of item by item um, to be very specific with you. But I do think whether it's the fact that we're a sole community hospital and so maybe that sole community hospital layer is being missed because there's an enhanced payment for that or whatever it is, um, the variances are probably not quite as big as what as what you're seeing. But but I appreciate that. I mean, I think in general, when it comes to overall both what we what we charge and what we get reimbursed, there are differences that make sense, right? It makes sense for community, uh, sole community hospitals to have something different than a tertiary, you know, facility to have something different than a critical access hospital. And so I understand that there are going to be differences. I think the real question that I can't answer for you is how, you know, how big are those differences? When do the differences become too big? You know. And I would add just one thought um, is that as you see graphs such as um, intensive care unit patients being able to be cared for in uh, Northwestern instead of having to go to the tertiary care center where there's already access issues or inpatient pediatrics being able to be cared for in the local community rather than parents have to travel to Burlington, know that there's good reasons for that and there's some impact on the overall cost of the entire Vermont healthcare system, and that there are some efficiencies to having care provided at the local level in community hospitals. And there's a real role for us here, and we desperately need a tertiary care center that has capacity, et cetera. We have one, great relationships with UVM, but I hope when you look at those graphs and say, okay, NMC is, is working hard to meet their community need and keep care local, that you reflect on some of this, and even if the numbers are not perfect, as Stephanie says, um, there's a, there's some insight there. Mm -hmm. And one final comment, I remember when I was first appointed to the board and took a tour and was at your hospital and I was in the emergency room and there behind a curtain was a patient and sitting there in a chair was an officer with a gun, you know? And so when the, um, uh, CON came for the emergency room. That was a just a a thought in my mind, you know, that just said this is the right thing to do. Um, it was just shocking to me. I just never expected to, you know, to see that kind of uh, contrast of a, a a patient. I think maybe with some psychiatric issues, sitting there with an officer, you know, with a loaded gun. So uh, uh, I really hope that emergency room kind of ends up being what you want it to be. Uh, and with that, I'll pass the ball back to Jess. Great. Thank you, Tom. And I will pass the ball over to our other Tom, Tom Walsh. Thank you, Jess. And um, uh, great questions, Tom. Um, Curtis, sir, I, I just, I, it's, this is a, I'm very glad that we're ending the day with you folks. I want to thank you for submitting such a, a, a clear um, budget and doing such a, a, a clear job explaining your assumptions around it. Um, it's obvious that one of the big things that you'll be working on in the next year to coming years is trying to reduce the reliance on travelers and um, recruit and retain. And I think that your choice to start on this, um, the, the term of phrase is a high reliability journey um, I've worked in that for the four years prior to um, being appointed to the board, worked with uh, Dr. Chasen at the Joint Commission for a number of years, and uh, was part of the effort to bring high reliability principles and practices to all of the 173 VA medical centers um, across the country. So I'm deeply familiar with what you're trying to start and, and the path that you're on. Um, and anybody who's done that will say that that work all begins with looking at your culture and addressing that culture 
is uh, one of the key aspects to recruiting and retaining. Um, most people don't know, however, that there's really solid evidence that efforts to improve the safety and reliability of an organization in healthcare is also highly correlated with improving outcomes that matter to patients. So it's not just an exercise to um, get to zero harm, which is with zero preventable harm, which is a very noble mission. But in addition, everyday patients where there's no error in their care also benefit. Less well known still, organizations that are successfully moving through the phases of maturity for high reliability, there's solid evidence that their financial performance improves. So um, your everything that I've read over 30 years of healthcare delivery and health policy, you're on the right path. Um, and your budget was, there's, there are struggles, right? But the way that you presented it, clear, straightforward, able to easily answer my colleagues' questions about your assumptions. And it's just, it's um, good for you. Uh, um, you're on the right path, and um, I, I, I hope that everybody around the state gets to see what you're doing and how it goes. Um, and so I'll turn it back to you, Jess. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, so I just have a couple of wrap-up questions, I think. Uh, the first, you probably have uh, prepared for this because I've asked it of every hospital, but I'm trying to understand the relationship between the 9.4% the change in charge and what the effective rate that a commercial rate payer in your community will really feel in their wallets. And so I know there's, it's not a direct correlation, you know, or a one for one mapping there. So um, I'm wondering if, if, and I know Stephanie, you may have this answer because I know you're always prepared and you hear what I ask other hospitals, but if you haven't, that's okay. If you could share that with Sarah Lindbergh afterwards, just so us to understand what that effective commercial rate experience will be. No, we're happy to share it. I, I have heard you ask it. And so, you know, I've I've already kind of huddled with Devin a little bit and said, like, the answer is pretty close and pretty much 9.4, right? Um, and so, yeah, for our organization, it's not going to be a, a, a big difference. It's going to be close, but we're happy to, you know, provide that information to Sarah and, yeah. Happy to do that. Okay, no, that's helpful because as you noticed, it is different for some organizations. There's a significant deviation between that. And so we're trying to understand that better. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, my second uh, area, I just wanna actually say, I appreciated the comments that you've made on capacity and measuring occupancy rate using staffed beds and not licensed beds. And in fact, uh, it was your reaction to that report that led us to bring this data in to the guidance this year and ask specifically for the differences between staffed beds, licensed beds, and the average daily census. And so um, I really appreciated that in the narrative and it's really helpful. So we're gonna, you know, we'll probably be uh, hopefully getting that from all the hospitals. We didn't get it from all the hospitals and their submissions, but we're trying to circle back to get that information. So we really can understand the capacity issues in the system. And I, this is just a, a parking lot uh, idea, but I, I, I do appreciate the impact and the growing costs associated with the throughput issues in our communities and, you know, log jams in the system as it relates to placing mental health patients in the appropriate settings, placing patients in post-acute settings. And I suspect for Northwestern that the, um, the, the, the cost has been tremendous. And I, you know, again, not for this process, but I'm hoping we can have conversations down the line where maybe, you know, if, if, you guys could take a leadership, maybe with Southwestern, who also has expressed this serious issue here. It would be really helpful for us to start to roll up what those annual costs are. And I mean like direct costs of patient care for those patients, but also inclusive of lost revenue, right? What If you had been able to place that surgery that you had to cancel in that bed, what was, you know, the, the opportunity cost or the indirect cost that's lost revenue. I think until we start to quantify those costs, we're never really going to start to, to, to bend the needle, you know, move the needle on this and really make a difference. And I think it would be really helpful if we could. And also, 
if there's a way, once you quantify the annual cost, you can back into what is the what is the cost to the commercial rate payer, right? What is that increase in change in charge or effective commercial rate that we're asking to cover these costs that if we had better throughput through the system, we'd be able to eliminate. So I just it's a it's a it's a request to to you know maybe and maybe if Mike Del Treco is listening, to pull together hospitals to do this and and maybe those some of those dollar values and impact on on change in charge and commercial rates will help us gain some momentum to try and find some solutions. And to be fair, I know people are working on you know these issues, but sometimes when you put a dollar value on things, it, you know, can light a little fire. So I'll just say that. And um, Jessica, you didn't ask a question, but I'll give you an answer to it. Sure. Because when I go back from this hearing and and report your observation and concern about the impact of throughput on the system, our emergency department medical director and the ED nurses will be thrilled. Our <laughs> care managers will be so grateful that you folks are tuned into that. Our progressive care unit nurses who just really want these patients to get to the right places in nursing homes or in, in mental health hospitals, et cetera, they will be grateful that, that this resonated with you and that there's a system issue and we can all work together on it. So. So I yeah. will relay that and people here will be pleased. Yeah, and offline, if you want to talk further about this, I'm happy to, to talk about that and maybe think about how we can gather this data. I think it will feed into our long-term sustainability planning efforts that we're trying to do through Act 167. I mean, I think that's a place and a placeholder for that, for that kind of work. So again, Stephanie, not for anything with this process, but a plea to like, let's see if we can get some of that data together so we can really understand this, I think, tremendous issue. Um, I, you know, a really thin margin for this year, you know, for fiscal year 23. I appreciate the fiscal conservativeness of that and trying to not have a huge impact on your community in terms of affordability. Um, there's so much uncertainty, so a little, you know, obviously worrisome, worrisome about all these budgets um, with that uncertainty in, in there, in the air. Um, I wondered, and usually board member Lunge asks this question, so I, it, it's going to be me today since I think it, she didn't today, but I, I noticed that there was no targeted cost savings initiatives in place. And given that thin margin, I just wondered if you could speak to that um, decision. Yeah, so we have, um, in the past, we have put in, you know, 500,000 or 750,000 worth of unidentified cost savings. Um, and have done a pretty good job actually at achieving that number. So this year when we put the budget together, we asked ourselves like, would we be successful if we did that? Um, and we felt like it would not be responsible this year to do that. But we have been really good about doing that in the past. And so I think what I can say is, you know, again, I've heard other presentations. And so when I listened to Southwestern, for example, I was like, Ditto, right? I want to just say ditto about Steve when it comes to, you know, every single time we renew a contract or enter into a contract, we're asking ourselves, do we really need the service agreement or are we going to, you know, risk it and say, we'll just pay time and materials? Mm -hmm. um, are we going to accept a contract that has anything bigger than a CPI increase? No, we're not. Um, are we going to go back to the vendor every time and ask for them to do better by three or five percent? Um, absolutely, we are. And so, you know, that work continues. The senior leadership team already um, has identified a couple of investments we want to make that we didn't budget for. And so we've challenged ourselves to be extremely disciplined around um, finding the thing that can come off in order to make an investment in this new thing. Um, and so, you know, it's it's definitely work we're still doing every single day. Um, I just didn't feel like, you know, it would have been responsible for us to put in something that was truly unidentified. Got it. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I just, my last kind of question is around uh, the wait times. And I appreciated, you know, your submission around the wait times. This is this is our first go at really trying to collect in a more meaningful way some of the referral uh, lag and visit lag data. Um, 
given some of the wait time issues in the state. We've collected it on and off in the past, but we're really trying to you know, get a better understanding of what is a good metric here. And I really appreciated your efforts to, to submit that data. Um, I noticed that you didn't have, you aren't collecting um, data on when the dates of referrals are made. So you weren't able to, you know, calculate the referral lags. And, you know, I and appreciate that, we, you know, we started this in March and you can't just change your systems overnight and all of that. Um, referral lags in that wait times report were a real source of frustration for primary care providers that we spoke to that they would make a referral and they wouldn't, and I'm not saying this is specific to Northwestern, this is general, you know, kind of feedback that we had from primary care providers across the state. So referral lags were a real source of frustration for primary care providers, not knowing when that actual appointment would be made. Um, so I guess I would just ask if, if it's possible to consider your systems and think about ways that you might be able to track that date of referral and begin thinking about how you can track referrals. Uh, referral lags. I do think they're important access metrics. If you don't measure them, you don't know if you've got a problem. You can't fix a problem you don't measure, right? So um, that point. And then, you know, as we think about one of the reasons we were trying to get information about access uh, and wait times was to really understand by specialty where are some of these log jams in the system. And so you submitted them, you know, aggregated by all specialty practices. It would be really helpful to see them disaggregated you know, by by practice area. So if that's readily available, it'd be helpful to see if it's not just pin, you know, pin parking lot for next year. These This is the type of data that we're trying to um, calculate or, you know, measure, understand, so we can understand the whole system. So thank you for that. Uh, if there's any information that is relevant um, since your budget submission that you didn't talk about today related to any changes in federal or state payments, uh, relief funds, donations, grants, you know, unexpected increases in Medicaid or Medicare would be really helpful if you could follow up with information to Sarah Lindbergh. So that's kind of my standard kind of parting question or request, I guess I would say. Um, right now it's just 184000 for Medicare, okay. but we'll, we'll document that and submit it to her. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I At this point, any board members have any follow-up questions? that they would just like to ask. Shaking the heads, okay. Um, then I will ask Sarah Lindbergh if you have any staff questions, team questions for Northwest. Uh, hello, Sarah Lindbergh, uh, head of the GMCB finance team. No questions. Uh, thanks for a very clear and timely submission. <laughs> Thank you All for right. you and your team. Well, then that's easy. Well, I see Sam online. So Sam, it is, I am, the ball is coming your way. Healthcare advocate. Good afternoon. Uh, good to see you, everyone, folks from Northwestern. Sam Peich, uh, health policy analyst with us, the healthcare advocate. And I'll try to keep my questions brief because I know it's a long day for everyone. Um, just want to start out Northwest by recognizing how you have continued to approach your DEI and health equity work with a lot of humility. And I think that really shines through in your presentation and particularly in how you conducted your community health needs assessment, particularly the formal interviews and focus groups you did with the indigenous community in your area. I think that that's really critical and I think a lot of hospitals can look to you as a leader in this area. So just wanted to take a second to recognize you for that. Um, and our questions actually stem, all of them stem from findings in the community health needs assessment. And the first one is one of the major findings that you reported is that community members lack access to reliable transportation as well as high quality nutritious food. I'm just wondering if you're what you're planning to do to address that as a challenge. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate your attention to it and I will pass along um, your words to the group that put that community health needs assessment together with Denise Smith. Um, here at NMC being point, but it being a broad community effort. Um, so thank you for that. Um, NMC's approach uh, to the community health needs assessment is not only different in how we collected the data, but how we intend to pursue it. Um, the action plan that's coming out that NMC will be part of will be from our, account our Accountable Communities for Health. And so it will be partners at the table looking at it and so for us, the question is, in an issue like transportation, what is the role of the community hospital in meeting that need? 
and how can we be better partners with uh, GMTA, the, the public um, access center? How do we help foster a community where taxis can be um, sustainable? How can we be a more walkable community? And what's the hospital's role in that? And similar for nutrition, um, we don't aspire to own all of the restaurants and grocery stores in northwestern Vermont and control what food is is out there. And, and at some point in our past, we may have. Um, but we've come to the realization that the hospital needs to be part of the answer. We can't be the entire answer. And so, um, and as we navigated that, it was hard for me. And we had, I had to come to the understanding that no, that's that's reality and it's pragmatic. And NMC desperately needs to be part of the answer. But we can't be all the answers. So we will be at the table with that accountable committee for health, with a strong and some in some instances it may be a financial investment is needed from the hospital, or it may be advocacy in the legislature about the need for high speed internet so that we can do telemedicine in towns like Sheldon um, that don't have great service. Um, so we're searching for our role in that. And again, a little bit more back into the humility piece of recognizing we got to be part of the answer. We can't be the full answer. So I don't have details for you yet because it's work in progress, but I love the fact that you're aware of it. Sure. Thank you for that. That's helpful. And this, this might speak to the finding your role question too. Um, but one other finding that I wanted to highlight and ask you for feedback on was 30% of respondents talk about elder care and dental services being inaccessible due to cost. And again, like some of these things overlap with partnerships, I imagine, and the yeah. accountable community work you're doing. But I just wonder if you can speak to the affordability challenge. Yeah, I, I, or, <laughs> I would say the affordability challenge feels like it goes all the way across healthcare. And so I, it, yes, our, our community health needs assessment did look at elder services in potential and dental services. We've been fortunate in recent years that Notch has been able to add dental services to the FQHC um, in rural areas. And uh, that was was something that, that we had to wrestle with as a community. And um, it has worked out well, and I think it served our community well. There may be opportunities in the future for Notch to to do more in dental to help with that. Um, and elder services are a concern for every partner um, at the table around how do you do that, especially for folks on fixed income. So I don't have uh, great answers for you, but I can tell you as we move through our prioritization process now, we're out at a lot of public gatherings and help getting our community to, it's almost a democracy of the community weighing in on all these different priorities. Where do you see the emphasis um, one of the real areas of emphasis that folks have is on that that access and affordability piece. So, I do know our community will be will be focused on that. Great, thank you so much. Those are all my questions. Back to you, Chair Holmes. Great, thank you, Sam. Um, at this point, I would happily open it up for any public comment. If folks have a comment they would like to make, they can use the the uh, raise your hand function on Teams, and I can see those folks or alternatively up oh, I see one okay Kathy Fulton hello Kathy hi Jessica and, and board and um, thank you for the opportunity I just want to recognize Dr. Minadeo's um, description of their um, high reliability journey and just say that we at VPQHC on a recent patient safety visit to Northwestern had the opportunity to see those um, amazing practices literally uh, in action. And um, Tom Walsh, to your comments, we, are, we have already invited Northwestern Medical Center to present um, information on their processes for their high reliability journey to the quarterly quality directors network so we'll have an opportunity for all the quality directors across the state to benefit from this wonderful program, great culture, and wonderful learning experience. So thank you very much. And I just want to um, recognize Northwestern for all their hard work and great efforts. 
Thank you, Kathy. Yes, it's very impressive and most appreciated. I'm glad there'll be some sharing of those learnings. Um, anybody else from the public wish to make a comment? Okay, well, seeing none, um, thank you to everybody. Thank you to Northwestern. This is a great presentation. It's been a long day for everybody, but uh, we really appreciated the clarity and the inspiration in your, in your presentation. We will be back here, the board will be back here online at 8.30 on Friday to hear the three hospitals associated with the UVM Health Network. So that is, stay tuned, more to come. With that in mind, again, thank you to Northwestern. Really, really appreciate your time today. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, Robin moved, and I will take Tom Pelham as a second on that motion. Everybody in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? No. All right. We are officially adjourned until Friday when we come back at 8.30. Thank you again, everybody. Thank, Thank you so you. much, folks. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank now. you. Bye.